So we want to welcome uh, Jita Modi, MD, MPH for Thoracic Surgical Oncology. And let's go ahead and, and find out a little bit more. Dr. Modi, uh, MD, M Masters in Public Health as well, joined the UNC Department of Surgery at Chapel Hill in 2018 as Assistant Professor in the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery. Dr. Modi received her degree in Molecular Biology and Computer Science from Vanderbilt University in 2002. Upon graduation, she entered Washington University School of Medicine, graduating in 2007. She began her general surgery residency at Brigham and Women's Children at Brigham, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and also completed research fellowship in global health equity in general surgery in 2012. She finished her cardiothoracic surgery residency in 2016 at that same institution. Dr. Modi received her master's in public health and clinical effectiveness from Harvard School of Public Health in 2012. She joined the faculty at the Harvard Medical School in 2016 and was most recently an assistant professor of thoracic surgery and associate surgeon at Brigham, Women at Brigham and Women's South Shore Hospitals. Dr. Modi, welcome. We're so glad to have you here today. Thank you, Mr. Pell. Thank you very much for that introduction. Absolutely. That's a phenomenal background. And what, what's one thing we should know about you outside of your professional background? Oh, um, well, lately, so most recently as a surgeon here okay. at University of North Carolina, I'm also a gardener and um, okay. have this um, uh, garden full of uh, zucchinis and tomatoes and other things I really enjoy to cook. So that's one non-professional uh, thing about me. Oh my gosh, well good for you, and the, and this is a great summer. Seems like we've had just the right amount of rain. Right. All right, well here's that first poll everywhere question. Uh, we've got uh, how should a solitary pulmonary nodule be managed? A, surveillance, B, resection, C, radiation, or D, multidisciplinary discussion. So this is, a, uh, we try to make this first one pretty straightforward. Um, while you're getting an opportunity to get in the poll everywhere and respond to that, I will say that this activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Edu Professional Development. William A. Wood, MD, MPH, and CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Chita Moody, MD, MPH, serves as an unpaid consultant to for Sivan Innovative. This relationship does not influence the planning or implementation of this activity. Dr. Modi has no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Look like we, we had a little bit of a typo there. And so that first slide was actually not the one that's coming up. I uh, apologize for that. Thoracic surgery refers to operations on organs in the chest, including the heart, lungs, and esophagus. And if you think that's true, mark that with an A for true, false, B for false. And uh, if you'll take just 15 seconds or so to uh, go ahead and put what you believe to be the correct answer. Great. Dr. Modi, how are they doing so far? Oh, very, very well. I'm glad, actually, that this question came because while the first seems simple, it um, isn't, in fact, as we'll discuss during the hour. So I think folks are doing very well. I cannot see how many have responded, but I'm pleased that everyone knows that thoracic surgery is, uh, refers to operations on organs in the chest. That's great. Great. We'll move on. Yeah, I was worried because usually we do put a softball and I was like, well, that wasn't quite as much of a softball as we usually went, but, uh, but we've got that softball question after all and you all did great. So let's go ahead and move on. Advances in thoracic surgical oncology. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Modi. Well, thanks, Tim. So I'm very pleased to be here to make this presentation. I hope that you'll find this lecture on advances in thoracic surgical oncology both interesting and useful for your practice. Um, my disclosures are listed here. Next slide. Okay, so the learning objectives for the talk. We'll start by describing approaches to early stage lung cancer treatment based on both the tumor size and its location. We will then compare treatment strategies for advanced lung cancer. And then finally, discuss the advantages of a multidisciplinary approach to the diagnosis and treatment of lung cancer. Next. 
this slide outlines the talk and I'll keep coming back to it to keep this on track. I, I think that where thoracic surgical oncology is going is in two ways. Uh, first, we have new technology that helps us localize, identify, and reset ever more smaller lesions that we may be detecting on uh, lung cancer screening scans. And then next, we have uh, more technology and chemotherapy and immunotherapies and testing for molecular markers that may help us treat more advanced stage lung cancers. Throughout this talk, I'll refer to existing literature and also provide some highlights from the 101st AATS conference, which was held in January of this year, and from ASCO 2021, which was earlier this summer. Next. We'll just take a moment to briefly review the epidemiology, which I know you're all very familiar with. Um, these are estimates from for 2021. And as you see, lung and bronchus cancer is the third most in incidence with over 200,000 cases routinely every year. Um, it actually accounts for far more deaths than number of cases. And uh, as you see there, greater than 130,000 deaths estimated for this year, 25% of all cancer deaths in the United States. Next slide. That is owing to the advanced stage of presentation of most lung cancers. As you see from the pie chart, the majority of cases present as distant or metastatic disease, more than 50%. Another quarter will be regional, already involving the lymph nodes uh, in the middle part of the chest. And then the least, about 15 to 20%, will present as localized disease, stage one or two, confined to the primary site. The survival directly relates to that. The um, patients who present early have a nearly 60% five-year survival rate, whereas it, those with distant metastatic disease is as low as five to six percent. So it's important as you gather to treat patients early and to detect cases in the earlier stage when possible. Next slide. Just uh, sort of do a touch base here on how surgery is used for lung cancer. In stage one and two disease, for medically operable patients, it is considered the first line therapy. Uh, after a tumor were resected, if it were larger, meaning greater than four centimeters, or involved the hyler, uh, those are called N1 lymph nodes, adjuvant chemotherapies would be offered. For stage 3A disease, which is regional, Surgery can be considered up front when there's no mediastinal involvement, those lymph nodes in the middle part of the test, chest, also called N2. And for patients who have already N2 disease at presentation, surgery can be considered after neoadjuvant therapies. There's a lot of debate and discussion in this area, and we'll touch on that. Now, as we get to the more advanced stages, stage 3B and 4, surgery is typically reserved for uh, procedures that provide diagnosis or palliation. Next. Okay, so for early stage lung cancer, the first topic I wanted to review was the use of low bar resections for treatment. Next slide. I'm gonna start us out with the case. This is of a 58 year old woman, a 44 pack year smoking history. Actually, did recount that she had been told about a right upper lobe nodule seen on a CT scan done after a motor vehicle collision some years ago. However, it had been lost to follow up. There were scans in between her presentations of clinic that showed that this tumor had gone up to three centimeters in size. Next slide. Due to social circumstances, the patient was lost to follow-up, but did end up developing symptoms, including a cough and weight loss. The patient came to the clinic and underwent a staging PET that did show avid hyler and mediastinal lymph nodes in addition to the primary lesion. Next. So you may gather where this is going, uh, given the topic of the presentation. The patient did end up having surgery. Um, and let's just discuss that how surgery is used very briefly here. So it is, as I said, the mainstay period of treatment for early stage lung cancer. There are greater than 80,000 lung resections done annually in, in the United States, and the rates of lung surgeries are increasing by about 2% a year. 
the figure shows the way that the incisions can be made. There's a maximally invasive incision called a thoracotomy and then minimally invasive incisions that we are using more commonly in surgery for treatment of early stage lung cancer. Next. Okay, I, we already have the answers for this, um, but that's okay. Um, Tim, I may not be understanding how it works, but here's the question. Which of the following are period of intent? No, and, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Modi, and I apologize. I think what happened, I think we accidentally had that slide ahead, and some folks may have, have gone in and, and filled out the answer already. So uh, normally they wouldn't see that until you begin to talk, but they do have a chance if they need to change their answers now to do that. And no like no problem different. at all. In fact, actually, I think this is great. I appreciate the enthusiasm. Um, <clears throat> so we had four choices there, lobectomy, segmentectomy, wedge resection with lymph node dissection, and D, all of the above. I, I see the numbers are changing, but they're probably not going to change significantly. You'll see as the slides roll out that the um, answer is all of the above, and I'll give the reasons for that. Okay, so there's the question. And here's sort of the answer. Okay, so the figure shows it's a little bit of a cartoon, but you'll get the idea. So I mentioned the patient had a right upper lobe um, mass that was three centimeters in size. Um, a wedge resection can be done in which the surgeon uses staplers to divide the lung tissue around the mass. The issue here is that the margin, um, meaning the normal tissue around the tumor size, may not be adequate. Uh, in order to reduce local recurrence rates, the margin must be at least a centimeter and typically should be twice the size of the tumor. In addition, the wedge resection requires uh, lymph nodes to be additionally harvested. So that would be along the airways going to the right upper lobe and in the mediastinum along the trachea and the subcarinal region. The next uh, figure over is segmentectomy. So there are 18 segments in the lung and the right upper lobe there are three. And if the tumor were confined to one segment, you can see that removing a segment of lung parenchyma may provide a greater margin. In order to reach the branches, the bronchus, pulmonary artery, and the veins that go to the segment, the lymph nodes in the hilar regions must be removed at the same time. So this is accomplished. But in addition, then two lymph nodes must be removed. Next, we have lobectomy, um, which, as you see, provides a greater margin, is more appropriate for larger tumors, and would provide uh, divisions of the right upper lobe bronchus, branches of the pulmonary artery to the right upper lobe and pulmonary veins, and the lymph nodes that go along those branches. Uh, that we'll see in the coming slides, this is the gold standard treatment for lung tumors, though there's nuance, including in patients who may not tolerate this larger resection. The fourth the cartoon figure is to show pneumonectomy, which may be required. That's removal of the whole lung on one side. That would be in the case of tumors that are larger and more central, uh, coming close to the divisions of the bronchus or the artery. Not shown in between are more complex resections, which are outside of the scope of this talk, which would be something like sleeve resection or bilobectomy. We can go to the next slide. Now, I'm, I'm hoping, Tim, that the references are showing at the bottom. My screen may not be optimized, but can everyone see the two references below the survival curves? Yes, those are displayed. Okay, that's important because this is, you know, really from a historical study, but it's one that's in, frequently cited, particularly with the uh, increasing attention to um, lung parenchymal sparing operations. Uh, in 1995, the results of a randomized trial um, that had been started some eight years prior were reported. Um, in this, uh, patients were randomized to either lobectomy or limited resection. This was for tumors uh, three centimeters or less. In the limited resection arm, both wedge resection and segmentectomy were performed in a roughly one-thirds, two-thirds ratio, meaning more segmentectomies than uh, wedge resection. Um, the, the study was very well designed. It was um, powered to uh, detect non-inferiority of lobectomy. And in that way, a um, one-sided uh, test of significance was done um, with the a priori p-value set of 0.1. Um, you can see there the second reference is from Dr. Frank Detterbeck, who some of you may have known um, at UNC. 
and he actually uh, republished these figures um, from some additional analysis that had been done after the study was originally published to emphasize the importance of the data itself, um, which as the title slide the title of the slide says that lobectomy showed improved outcomes, including long-term survival and recurrence rates when compared to limited resection, again, including both wedge and segmentectomy. Next slide. So, you know, maybe cat out of the bag there, but as you can imagine, this patient first went and underwent mediastinal staging uh, to prove that the N2 nodes were negative and this was still localized disease then underwent a video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery, abbreviated VATS, right upper lobectomy, and was found to have on final pathology a three and a half centimeter tumor and two hyalur lymph node stations were involved. Accordingly, the patient was referred for adjuvant chemotherapy. Next slide. Now, this patient had enough lung uh, function and reserve to undergo the lobectomy. However, there are patients who may have worse pulmonary function, comorbidities, including cardiac, have had prior lung resections or have multifocal disease, um, including lesions on the other side, which may require later resection. In those cases, sublobar resection may need to be considered, and we'll review some of the evidence in the coming slides to support the use of sublobar resections. Next. Let's have the next, but thank you. So this is fine. Segmentectomy has equivalent short-term survival to lobectomy. Now it's short-term because we're still waiting on the long-term results of both the CLGB trial and the Japanese Clinical Oncology Group trial. These are phase three randomized trials, um, randomizing patients with small tumors, uh, two centimeters or less, to either sublobar, meaning anatomic segmentectomy versus lobar resection. And the uh, Interim analysis here, 30-day and 90-day mortality are equivalent for these patients in all age groups. And this lays the stage for future analysis, though those results are still pending. And the thoracic surgery community will be very interested to see uh, what features of the tumor should dictate the choice of a sublobar resection. In general, right now, if a patient can tolerate lobectomy, that is what is recommended. However, we do understand that for patients with very small tumors or no solid component or features that suggest more favorable histology, a segment technique could be considered. We'll be awaiting the results of Dr. Al Torquey's and other uh, studies in the coming years. Next. I just wanted to give you a, an interoperative picture to illustrate some of the technique done to perform segmentectomy. Here, we're looking robotically, and what's being performed is a left lower lobe superior segmentectomy. The tumor is sort of the dark, hazy part under there. The uh, already has been performed is division of the superior segmental pulmonary artery branch in the vein, as um, uh, well as the airway. What's been done is the ICG, which is a fluorescent dye, has been injected systemically and allowed to circulate. And then a filter is put on the robotic camera, which allows us to see the tissue that remains perfused. So of course the left upper lobe and the basilar segments of the left lower lobe. That allows the surgeon to more precisely apply the stapler and divide the parenchyma of the superior segment, separating it from the rest of the tissue. Next slide. Okay, so in the first case that we reviewed, the lung nodule was three centimeters. That wasn't going to be difficult to find at the time of surgery. But increasingly, particularly with lung cancer screening protocols and other um, ways that patients are followed with imaging, we're finding smaller nodules. And therefore, the need for interoperative tools to do nodule localization has increased. Next slide. This is a second case. So in this one, it's a 63-year-old man who'd had a former smoking history, but was undergoing scans for restaging of a different cancer. And those scans showed over the period of two years an increase in a, a ground glass opacity in the right lower lobe. I put the red circle around it because it can be hard to see otherwise. As you can imagine, this is a very um, sort of soft lesion, one that may not be visualized in the time of surgery or even palpated. 
and therefore steps need to be taken to help the surgeon identify the lesion for the diagnostic resection, which would precede the therapeutic lobectomy. Next slide. So this patient underwent a preoperative CT scan, laying in the position that surgery would be done. That CT scan uh, technology is used to generate essentially a 3D map. It's uploaded into a software system that links to electromagnetic sensors that are placed both on the patient's chest and at the tip of a bronchoscope that's guided into location of the nodule at the time of surgery. Once the nodule is targeted, dye is injected typically percutaneously, and it can be a blue colored dye or the fluorescent dye that I showed you before at the map site. And in doing so, a, a small tattoo is left such that when the video assisted or robotic assisted surgery is started, the surgeon is able to visualize that dye intraoperatively. You can see that in the pictures on the right. Next slide. And there, there are other technologies that are coming, uh, including here at UNC, for this type of uh, nodule localization. One of them is called robotic bronchoscopy. Again, using a CT scan and a map, a very flexible bronchoscope with very flexible catheters is inserted through the airway. An endotracheal tube has been placed. And as you see in the bottom pane, the, the nodule is localized using the mapping technology. Once localized, the small catheters can go through the working channel of the bronchoscope and actually sample um, with excellent um, sensitivity and specificity uh, this lung nodule. So meaning to say uh, the diagnostic rates of robotic bronchoscopy are increased to as high as 80%, allowing under potentially single anesthesia the nodule to not only be localized but diagnosed and then resected at the same time. Next slide. But there are actually a number of approaches that are being developed aside from insertions of dyes or um, uh, fiducial markers that can be palpated. One uh, was discussed by the Japanese group from Kyoto um, at AATS in January, which allows uh, RFID chip to be implanted through the bronchoscope and using a probe that's waved essentially over the target anatomy um, no palpation of the lung tissues needed. So this is more gentle and maybe more accurate helping localize small lesions. So the figures are from an early study published by the same group in which they've done a canine model to study the feasibility of this technology. You see the very small chip, tip on the, uh, chip on the fingertip. And then uh, after it's implanted, the localizing probe, which generates an audio signal. Next slide. same paper. So the bronchoscope is coming down the endotracheal tube, going down the left-sided airway, and then this uh, micro RFID tag is put at the lung nodule. Next slide. So the first in human trials uh, were reported. Um, those started in September 2019. Two institutions were involved. Uh, the surgeons tagged 19 lesions and performed the listed resections afterwards. Uh, they said there were no adverse events, including the chip getting lost or being dislodged, bleeding, or any other concerns. And they reported that the margin depth was on average uh, 10 millimeters, meaning that, you know, if this were, let's say, a metastatic cancer, um, and uh, it, the intent was to both uh, diagnose and therapeutically treat uh, the tumor with surgery, with lung resection, an adequate margin could likely be achieved due to the accuracy of putting in the RFID uh, chip. This is just the tip of the iceberg for types of technologies. Um, uh, researchers here at UNC, um, including Dr. Egan's group and others, are doing work to improve nodule localization, which will certainly augment um, the advances in thoracic surgical oncology as they come along. Next slide. So I think it's important to talk about minimally invasive surgery. It's, uh, you know, since um, the 90s, um, that surgery has become increasingly popular and used um, in the last decade, robotic surgery as well. Uh, by converting the large incision to smaller incisions uh, and still doing the surgery in the same amount of time with uh, similar oncologic outcomes to open surgery, patients have had better outcomes. 
we um, have yet uh, to see um, trials to support that in randomized fashion, and that's what I'm very excited to share with you next. Next slide. So this trial, Violet, very clever name. This was for bats. This was uh, done in the UK across nine centers. And the trialists published their uh, protocol ahead of time. So in 2019, they released this. And they described a recruiting. These are patients with anywhere from T1 to T3 tumors um, and zero to, and zero to one um, uh, for clinical staging. And they all the patients referred for lobectomy of these centers were assessed for eligibility to this trial. Um, this trial examined clinical and quality of life outcomes in patients who were randomized to bats or open surgery. Um, the uh, early outcomes have already previously been reported, and at um, uh, this year's ASCO, the long-term outcomes, one-year outcomes were given. Uh, so next slide. So I mentioned the study design um, over uh, the study period. They did have 503 um, participants. And the results line by line favor bats. So less pain on the visual analog scale, less uh, opioid consumption, better physical functioning is measured on the EORTC quality of life questionnaire, uh, both at five weeks and one year, improved general global health status, fewer surgical complications, and no differences in serious adverse events by grade. A shorter hospital stay, one-year readmission rates were lower, and the progression-free survival and overall survival were similar in both arms. These, I think, are pretty outstanding results to help support VATS and minimally invasive surgery as the standard of care for early stage lung cancer resection. Next slide. This, this slide is actually a picture from one of our UNC operating rooms. The surgeon, I don't know if you can see, all the way in the back is sitting at a robotic council, and our physician assistant is up front at the patient's bedside to assist the surgery. What the robot does is to convert the typically two-armed, one-camera uh, VATS approach to a three-arm, one-camera robotic approach. The port placement is a little bit different, and the instruments have more flexibility. Uh, the visualization is increased by having essentially two camera lenses that help generate a 3D image. But the idea is the same, small incisions, avoid rib spreading, um, and provide visualization to do some, uh, some pretty um, use, you know, useful things, like increase the exposure for segmental dissections and take more lymph nodes. And I'll show you that uh, from some studies. Next slide. So, the um, data to support robotics has been largely retrospective series that compare historical cohorts and demonstrate adequate safety and good oncologic outcomes. Some um, other types of studies have been done. So this one was very interesting. This was a single institution that examined its own approach to lung resections for lung cancer. And they noted that in the years before, so in 2018, then compared to 2019, robotic uh, technology introduction, how many segments were being done and what percentage of the total cases. So as you can see, the rates of performing segments did increase after introduction of the robotic technology. And that might be important for some of those patients that we discussed earlier in the talk, uh, those with multifocal disease or compromised pulmonary function. So uh, while you know, one institution's experience, this may point towards the future such that in patients who don't have enough reserve to undergo lobectomy, they may still be able to be offered surgery as part of their lung cancer treatment. Next slide. So one commonly cited advantage of robotic technology is improvement of the lymph node sampling. Um, because the visualization is both 3D and, and much more zoomed in, the lymph nodes can be seen in great detail and the entire lymph node packet can be removed. Uh, so we routinely remove lymph nodes from the paratracheal and subcarinal regions. And uh, as we start the hilar dissection, each um, branch will come with a different lymph node and lymph node number. Um, but the question is, are we getting as many lymph nodes uh, doing this uh, minimally invasively? And how does uh, video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery bats compare to the robot-assisted in terms of the number of stations that are sampled? So this was a study looking at the Society of Thoracic Surgeons database over a number of years and identifying the um, re lung resections that were done there. 
in the robotic lung resections more commonly compared to open and bat surgery, uh, greater than six lymph nodes were removed. So uh, for robotic surgery, 34 um, percent of cases had greater than six lymph nodes removed, uh, bats 14 and, and open 18. Uh, interestingly, while this is a statistically significant result, I want to think about whether this is clinically important. Um, and there was an increase um, uh, with statistical significance in upstaging in robotic surgery. So what that means is that um, we may have thought clinically that the patient had no hyalur lymph nodes involved, but on the, the pathologic analysis, a hyalur lymph node was found um, most commonly, though mediastinal lymph nodes may also be involved. And in the robotic cases, uh, upstaging happened in 6.2% of cases compared to 5.6 in bats and 8.2% in open. Um, so if we were to look at that, essentially we say that robotics can get us close to the open rate of lymph node um, diagno diagnostic capability uh, without the increased morbidity. Next slide. So I, I did want to briefly touch on the use of SBRT because there will be patients who aren't medically operable or have some contraindication to proceeding with surgery. Uh, this could serve as a whole another hour's talk, but I think important to bring some studies uh, to bear here. So next slide. At uh, ASCO 2021, an abstract was presented uh, that took forward the STARS trial, which was one of two present-day trials comparing stereotactic ablative radiotherapy to um, lobectomy for lung cancer. So those two trials, the STARS and Rosal trials, uh, both closed early due to low um, en enrollment and recruitment. Uh, but the investigators did pull the analysis because in the absence of otherwise randomized data, an answer needed to be given as to at least the equivalency of these therapies. Um, so when these analyses were pulled um, from STARS and ROSAL, it was found that there were equivalent rates of progression for SBRT versus lobectomy, and in fact, a higher three-year overall survival rate for SBRT, as you see there. But there are some criticisms, um, you know, first, uh, small numbers, only 60 patients in total. Next, a shorter um, follow-up period, three years. And finally, variable use of the minimal invasive technology that we just discussed has really um, pushed the envelope in terms of improved uh, outcomes for patients. So to uh, circumvent that, the um, investigators of STARS extended that into a single-arm prospective trial, which was compared to a historical cohort of that lobectomy with the mediastinal lymph node dissection. Um, they enrolled 80 patients and report their overall survival rates at five years, um, which were actually greater at 87% compared to in the VATS lobectomy group of 72%, and their progression-free survival rate was 77% in the SBRT group. When a propensity score matched analysis was done, comparing SBRT versus the VATS um, lobectomy plus mediastinal lymph node dissection. It's important to get all that in there. This did show non-inferiority. So the conclusions of the um, Dr. Chang and others who presented this in ASCO were the SBRT may be considered non-inferior inferior and may have a role in some patients, um, but the multidisciplinary discussion about the role of this therapy as compared to surgery must be done. And I think the relevance in current practice of this research is that the um, patients with shorter uh, life expectancies or contraindications, of course, to surgery uh, should be considered for this therapy. Next slide. Okay, so we're back to that overview, and we've uh, gone through the discussions for uh, localized disease. Uh, now we'll give some consideration to how surgery is used in stage 3A disease. Next. So in order to offer a patient surgical resection, the surgeon will often, before they start any other therapies, meet with them and review the imaging and give consideration to the resectability of the tumor. And I think it's, it's interesting that as surgical technology advances, defining resectability may actually change. Next slide.
So again, there's 3A disease that's N2 and 3A disease that's not N2. And so we're going to talk about the large tumors here, T3 and T4 tumors, uh, you know, those greater than five centimeters. And that may be dependent on the location. So large tumors that are in the superior sulcus in the very top of the chest are treated differently than large tumors that are elsewhere. Um, again, a tumor may also invade the chest wall, and that might be a reason that it's considered advanced stage. In general, invasion to the proximal airway is considered um, not a contraindication uh, to resection. Um, and depending on which mediastinal structure is involved, uh, certainly it can be considered. Pericardium could be resected, diaphragm could be resected, and so on. Next slide. Traditionally, involvement in the spine was handled uh, very carefully because this could be an extremely morbid condition that could require resection of uh, multiple vertebrae. Um, but extending the experience that we had with doing vertebral resection for patients with metastatic disease to their spine, um, many groups have taken on invasion of either partial, as in uh, figure B, or total uh, involvement of the verte vertebrae with a lung tumor. Um, next slide. So there's many different ways to approach this. At my uh, prior practice, one way was to first um, stabilize the spine posteriorly, and on the same day, uh, proceed with anatomic lung resection, typically through thoracotomy, and um, uh, remove the remaining rib in and block with the lung tumor itself. A cage is inserted to stabilize the spine, and after the uh, operation, the, the patient will have no spine instability or other problems. This was done commonly in combination with orthopedics and neurosurgery. We did examine our experience, again, at single institution, um, but 32 patients over a 12-year time period were identified. There was fair amount of surgical morbidity, as you see there, 56%, because it's a pretty extensive operation that involves resecting a portion of the spine. Um, but there was a very acceptable short-term complication rate with 3% mortality in 30 days. And the one-year and five-year survivals um, for these at stage 3A tumors at 73 and 40% uh, respectively um, were very respectful. Um, so, you know, just to show that through multidisciplinary work and uh, the new materials and techniques that are available, uh, that even spine um, involvement, the bony involvement of the spine can be considered as not a contraindication to resection. Next slide. This slide is just to highlight a case example of a person who was very young and presented with an advanced tumor, at least abutting if not involving the aortic arch adventitia. In this case, the cardiac and thoracic surgeons work together to place a stent across the proximal aorta to stabilize it for the eventual planned interoperative dissection for left upper lobectomy. And, uh, you know, certainly a plane of adventitia um, can be removed um, with a side biting clamp in place. However, you do not want to lose control of that area. So the stent helped provide um, stability. And the patient did quite well with later removal of the stent after the lung had been resected. Next slide. But more commonly, it, an area for increasing discussion is the application of neoadjuvant regimens for stage 3A lung cancers, particularly those involving the N2 nodes. Uh, there is evolving practice in the area, and some of it's very institution-specific, but I'd like to present some uh, historical and some um, more recently published and discussed studies in this area. Next slide. So again, there's a lot of controversy in the management of stage 3A disease, and um, some of the very important trials date back to the establishment of concurrent chemo and radiotherapy as safe treatments for induction uh, before lung resection. Uh, the SWOG trial in 1995 uh, used doses to 45 gray for patients with N2 or N3 disease and, uh, T4, and or T4 tumors. Uh, that was later followed with a series of dose escalation trials, including um, in 2012 establishment of 61 gray as a safe neoadjuvant therapy. 
Um, two other studies are listed here, um, and you know we were just discussing this as a group the other day. It depends on your read of their results. Uh, induction chemoradiotherapy was given to patients who were randomized at no progression to either surgery or continued radiotherapy, and uh, the analysis showed no overall survival advantage between the two groups and progression-free survival being better in the surgery arm, which would be expected because the tissues are receptive. An important subgroup analysis is commonly cited, and that's that there was improved survival in the patients who only require lobectomy after their neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy, rather than needing a more extensive resection like pneumonectomy, because that's a much more morbid um, surgical resection. This is now, um, you know, more data is coming to light that extended resections can be performed after neoadjuvant therapy, but is still applied in practice and, and should be considered when determining the use of surgery after chemoradiotherapy for patients with advanced lung cancer. Uh, the other, the European trial listed below, oh, can you go back? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm getting there, sorry, Tim. So the European trial, um, listed uh, beneath that that's more recent supported the same, that there is no difference in five-year survival between these groups. I think the takeaways from these series of studies are that if if um, the chemo, or we'll see in other slides, other uh, systemic treatments can improve mediastinal clearance as well as the radiotherapy, patients will have better overall survival, and that surgical resection may be best considered in those who have large tumors and uh, sterilized uh, N2 disease in whom the local recurrence is the greatest threat as opposed to micrometastases or, or um, the systemic spread of their disease. Okay, next slide. And it, so to that point, in uh, AATS, the Swiss um, group presented results of three pooled trials in which patients with 3A disease, including single and um, double and multi-station N2, as well as 3B, were um, given either chemo plus surgery or chemo and sequential radiotherapy and surgery. And I think the most important findings of their trials were are summarized in the results. A large number of patients eventually came to resection at greater than 80%, and of those, 80% had an R0, meaning uh, put the, all the margins were negative. Um, including a good percentage of the patients who underwent extended resections. So notably, they're not like the extended resections I showed earlier. These were mostly chest wall resections. In this group, overall survival was 45% at five years and 28% at 10 years. Um, so this is excellent in uh, terms of long-term follow-up. And they found similar survival rates, uh, though didn't provide the precise numbers of uh, patients who'd undergone extended resections after neoadjuvant therapy. Next slide. Okay, so this um, it may be our last poll ever question. Which of the following can be considered for treatment of stage 3A lung cancer? Would it be surgery only? Choice B, surgery plus adjuvant chemotherapy. C, neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy or immunotherapy and surgery. A D, definitive chemoradiotherapy plus minus immunotherapy or E, all of uh, B, C, and D. What well, everyone replied. Oh, there we go. We're getting more. Great. That's the last results trickle in. So just make mention that this 3A could be patients with just large tumors or. Um, you know, a large tumor involved in the chest wall plus a hyaluronic lymph node, or it could be the type of patient who has mediastinal involvement. So I would think B, C, or D would be the right answer. So this is a little bit of a leading question for sure. Next slide. So I did want to talk a little bit about adjuvant regimens and how they're changing, mostly because what we're learning from that arena may influence how we treat patients new adjuvantly before surgery. So I'll discuss one trial that's mostly from oncology and then give you um, an overview of a trial that was presented at ASCO uh, that involves neoadjuvant immunotherapy. Next slide.
So the Pacific trial may be familiar to um, many of the, you in the audience. Uh, this is using immunotherapy after definitive chemoradiotherapy in patients who are not planned for resection stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer. And as you see in the survival curves, um, when comparing immunotherapy versus placebo, um, median progression-free survival was longer in the 12-month progression-free and 18-month, at uh, the time of this analysis, uh, progression-free survival rates were higher in those who received immunotherapy. Um, the uh, trial has actually published uh, several follow-ons from this, but I think consolidation with immunotherapy is now uh, going to be um, part of treatment regimens uh, for patients uh, with adequate tissue expression to um, receive it. And, uh, we'll probably be hearing more from the Pacific investigators as time goes by. So this obviously doesn't apply to surgical patients, but what have we learned from it? Next slide. The Checkmate study uh, investigators released some of their results of the surgical outcomes um, from their trial. Uh, this was using nivolumab and uh, chemo versus chemo alone in patients with resectable um, stage 1B by the AJCC 7th edition, so it'd be stage 2 now in 3A disease. Um, these patients were to have no known targetable mutation, and notably of those that they enrolled, um, a good number, 64% had 3A disease. So again, the patients were randomized to either pre-op uh, immuno plus chemo um, or chemo only. And they've already uh, shown us that these patients have improved pathologic complete response and the depth of the pathologic response for all stages in the um, immuno plus chemo arm. What was new, next slide, was uh, the um, information about the surgical treatments themselves. So again, and a good number of patients, 83% um, in the immuno plus chemo arm compared to 75% in the chemo arm went on to surgery. About a third of these could be done minimally invasively, and I think that's owing to the number of 3A patients that were in the trial. Uh, their conversion rates are listed in similar in both arms. Um, lobectomy was performed in 77% um, of the patients in the immuno plus chemo arm versus 61% in the chemo only arm. Pneumonectomy in 17% of patients getting immuno plus chemo and 25 in the other. The R0 resection rate is very impressive, 83% in the immuno plus chemo arm, and the percent of viable tumor was only 10% after neoadjuvant immunotherapy. The duration of the surgery is listed as the same, 148 minutes, 184 minutes on average versus 217. Though anecdotally, we may hear of more fibrosis after immunotherapy, which may affect surgery, uh, perhaps in terms of blood loss or other considerations. However, length of stay was the same, and the rate of surgical adverse events, including severe events, was the same in both arms. So this is very encouraging that immunotherapy could be considered in the neoadjuvant treatment. And in fact, some people are discussing whether resectability should only be discussed and considered after restaging once the immunotherapy is done. Uh, which may um, improve our ability to um, treat patients with stage 3A disease and therefore reduce the local recurrence rates and improve progression-free survival. Next slide. Okay, so this is, the, this is the last question. This is about the management of a solitary pulmonary nodule. So we're getting a little less technical here and starting to think about the other things that go into the care of uh, early stage lung cancer patients and advanced stage lung cancer patients aside from surgery. And I'm really pleased to see that everyone sees here there's not one right answer except for to talk to the whole group. So there's been actually a number of studies demonstrating a multidisciplinary model of thoracic oncology care significantly improves outcomes for patients without increasing waiting time. Uh, what they can take the um, shape of many forms, but essentially involves having a tumor board in which imaging um, experts and pulmonologists, oncologists, radiation oncologists, and surgeons are all together to discuss care. And the reason I wanted to bring this to light was to show a slightly different way of looking at the utility of a thoracic oncology board than simply the outcomes for the patients, which are, of course, extremely important. Next slide. 
And Dr. Modi, uh, while that slide's populating, I just want to let our audience know that I'm going to go ahead and open up the uh, questions slide, the questions poll everywhere area. So if you do have questions, you can go ahead and start typing those in in just a few seconds on poll everywhere. So we'll have those ready for the end of the talk. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate that. So. Uh, here, this is research that was conducted by my research resident, Dr. Williams, during her uh, training time. And uh, this um, shows an algorithm that, that we follow every week in our tumor board, every day in our practice. But essentially, how do we determine what to do with that indeterminate solitary pulmonary lung nodule? Um, we take a look at the imaging to determine whether it's amenable to biopsy before surgery but also have a multidisciplinary discussion about the medical operability of the patient, what other diagnostic modalities can be employed, and whether serial imaging seems appropriate given the risk for the patient. And we were able to review a series of cases and put patients into groups based on this algorithm. There's a group that you would resect if the imaging history are highly concerning. There's a group that you would resect because based on the history, uh, the patient may um, uh, need to go straight to surgery because a non-diagnostic biopsy wouldn't change our management. And finally, there's a group that gets biopsies, but uh, if they're not diagnostic, and obviously this will improve with, it, with the robotic technology for bronchoscopy, but if they're not, not diagnostic, we need to decide, do we watch them or do we go ahead and resect? And for larger tumors, that might be the case. So next slide. Dr. Williams was able to review our single institution experience and in looking at the patients for whom we weren't certain of the diagnosis, um, which of these were found to have primary lung cancer is listed on the left and which were found to have some other pathology. They did all undergo lobectomy um, and interestingly only a very small number ended up having a lobectomy for lesions that were not ultimately uh, lung cancer. That came out to two, only 2.5%, two which is uh, sort of showing us that we are able to, through our uh, imaging and pre-op biopsies and nodule localization, really keep the number of patients who are having major pulmonary resections uh, without that being therapeutic for them to a very low number. And as far as we're aware, that's not formally published in the literature as of yet and will be coming out. Um, that article is currently in press. Next slide. These are the references. There were, I think, 20 in total that were used throughout the talks so that you can refer to them. Um, I'm, I was really pleased to be able to share these AATS and ASCO abstracts, which will obviously be coming for publication later. Next slide. And I think that wraps it up, uh, hopefully in the right time frame. Mr. Poe will tell me if not. Absolutely. No, that was perfect. Okay. And I'd really, really uh, like to welcome questions. That, that's what I'm missing in this virtual format is the chance to interact and go back and forth. Great. So hopefully we'll see those coming in now. Bear with me for just a second. I'm going to uh, moderate those as we're going through. So I'm using a little bit of a different interface to do that today, but I think that should be Fine. So we'll look for those to come in. While we're waiting for those questions to, to arrive, I do want to ask about the robotic surgery. At this point, is that all, all being done with the surgeon in the room, or uh, to what extent is it being looked at in terms of the, the surgeon being in a different location with the physician's assistant uh, by, the, by the robot and the, the patient? Yeah, as far as I, I'm aware, both platforms for robotic surgery currently involve the console for the surgeon being very close, very proximal to the patient. It could be outside of the room. And in fact, mm -hmm. um, we do have our teaching console in just, you know, across the hall, essentially. But yeah, I'm not certain um, where the future that will lie for thoracic surgery, specifically because of the um, anatomy and the risk that could be involved if um, hands-on um, uh, invasive surgery is needed. So uh, for now, I think we'll plan to stay not far away, but really appreciate the extra flexibility around that bony thoracic cage. Sounds good. We're, we're still waiting for those questions to come in via poll everywhere. We did have one come in via the chat. What are the 
treatment implications for clinical N1 patients who go uh, directly to surgery and is found to have N2 disease would have otherwise had chemo-RT. Right. So it, this is something that we would say, you know, surprise N2 disease uh, should hopefully not happen with PET mm -hmm. technology the way it is and our ability to sample the mediastinum with either EBUS or mediastinoscopy as needed, we shouldn't find this too commonly. However, if N2 disease were discovered in the setting of a planned resection, resection should be completed, and then the patient, once healed from surgery, should be referred um, for chemotherapy and quite possibly radiation in the mediastinum. Um, outcomes for patients who complete all the therapy should be just as good as if they were sequenced differently. The problem would be if they don't recover well from their surgery and have delays in receiving chemotherapy. Great. Thank you so much. I am not seeing any other questions in Poll Everywhere. What I'm going to do is uh, advance the slides and do it, take care of a few other things, and then we'll return to that page uh, one more time and see if any questions have come in at that point. Uh, as we've mentioned, we have a new learning portal, and I want to thank you all for your patience. I know that, that there have been a, a, a few hiccups uh, over the last couple of weeks as we've gotten this all uh, going and optimized. I, I do want to encourage you, if you're having any trouble at all with the learning portal, I really want to encourage you, reach out to us, 919-445-1000 or unclcn at unc.edu, and let us know. We're here. We we have a, a staff who, who knows about this and can assist you with any trouble you're having with that portal, with claiming credit, et cetera. So uh, we do apologize for some of the hiccups, and we're there to help you out as, as we move forward. We want to say thank you. Uh, we want to say thank you to the people of North Carolina. Uh, through their support of the UNC, the University Cancer Research Fund and the UNC Leinberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. We want to thank Mary King and Veneranda Obore and John Powell and Aaron Schmidt for all the work they do on each and every one of these lectures.